so let me uh, begin by acknowledging uh, uh, the Deputy Minister, Ambassador Vayas. Uh, Your Excellency, there are a number of Latin American ambassadors here present with us today. Uh, colleagues, good morning, buenos dias. On behalf of uh, the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies, ANCLAS, let me welcome you all to the Australian National University. In accordance with the custom here at ANU, let me begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands the university operates and paying our respects to the elders of the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people, past, present and emergent, whose ancestors have protected and nurtured these lands for tens of thousands of years. I should also mention that this event will be recorded and eventually be made available publicly. We're particularly fortunate to have with us today the Deputy Foreign Minister of Ecuador, Ambassador Luis Vallas, as well as the Under Secretary of the Foreign Ministry responsible for Asia and Oceania, Ambassador Helena Yanes, and Ecuador's Ambassador to Australia, His Excellency Arturo Cabrera. For many of us, Ecuador is a supremely exotic destination. Most people associate Ecuador for, with two things. First, its location on the equator. Ecuador, after all, is the Spanish word for equator. Secondly, the Galapagos Islands, known for their large number of endemic species that was studied by Charles Darwin during the voyage of HMS Beagle, that helped inspire his theory of evolution. Maybe less well known is that despite its relatively small size, Ecuador has the most biodiversity per square kilometer of any nation in the world. Or that it is the first state to have recognized in its constitution the rights of nature. The visit by the Deputy Minister to Canberra for bilateral talks with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has very fortuitously provided us a rationale for holding this public forum today on plastic pollution. Along with climate change and biodiversity loss, plastic pollution is one of the greatest human-induced threats facing the Earth. Plastic pollution contaminates terrestrial, freshwater and marine ecosystems. Microplastics infiltrate the food and water that we consume and the air that we breathe. They can harm wildlife populations and communities alike. And they threaten the ecological balance of the planet. Ambassador Vallas is particularly well placed to speak to the issue of plastic pollution because in addition to being Deputy Foreign Minister, he's a member of the Bureau of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee that was mandated by the UN Environment Assembly last March to negotiate a multilateral agreement to end plastic pollution by the year 2024. But let's move to the substantive part of today's forum. Our objectives are essentially threefold. First, to consider Australia's take on the environmental and legal issues around the challenge of plastic pollution. And to address this item, I'll shortly ask Kate Lynch, who heads the Environment Protection Division of the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. The second objective is to get a sense of steps being taken by the island countries of the Pacific perhaps the marine environ environment most adversely affected by plastic pollution. And our speaker on this item is Dr. Sasha Fuller, an environmental anthropologist from the University of Newcastle. The third objective is to look ahead to the scope for developing a global approach to reducing or eliminating plastic pollution. In particular, the prospects for negotiating a multilateral agreement and the role that countries like Ecuador and Australia can play to that end. This will be the theme of our keynote speaker, the Deputy Foreign Minister, Ambassador Luis Vallas. And finally, I suggest after the presentations, 
that we have a conversation, an opportunity for you, the audience, to direct questions to the speakers, to comment on what they've said or maybe not said, and to think aloud about potential solutions, whether they relate to government policies, to legal measures, to scientific applications, or to new and emerging technologies to deal with the problem of plastic pollution. So let me now give the floor to Kate Lynch to provide some context to Australia's pro approach at the national level to reducing or eliminating plastic pollution. How big is the problem of plastic pollution in Australia? What have its main impacts been on wildlife, on ecosystems, on human health and on the economy? What policies and regulatory measures have been taken at the national level to improve plastic waste collection, to increase recycling rates and to eliminate the use of single-use items like plastic bags? And how effective have those measures been? And finally, what are the projections for plastic pollution if we continue business as usual? So in 10 minutes or less, uh, Kate, that is the, uh, the challenge. I now give the floor to you. Morning, everybody. Um, I can't promise you that I'll necessarily answer all of those questions in 10 minutes, uh, but I will do my very best. I'd like to start this morning just by uh, also extending my own uh, respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting here today uh, and pay my respect to the Ngunnawal and the Gambri peoples, uh, their elders, past, present and emerging, um, and particularly welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us this morning. I also extend uh, a special uh, welcome again uh, to the ambassadors, uh, to other dignitaries in the room. Uh, it's lovely to have you all here this morning. I'd like to offer some reflections uh, about Australia's priorities for the international treaty process uh, this morning, as well as our domestic action on plastics. We're certainly seeing clear ambition for increased international leadership on the environment from uh, the Australian government. Australia's Minister for the Environment and Water, the Honourable Tanya Plibersek, recently stated her ambition to see a plastics-free Pacific in her lifetime, uh, which is certainly an ambition uh, that's worthy of pursuing. So firstly, on plastics, on the plastics problem, we're all here today because we know there is a problem. But plastics also has a role in our society. It is incredibly useful. It's durable, flexible and light. And it does play an important role in many sectors. It, it's essential, it's become essential in our modern societies. But its use has grown at a rate that's completely unsustainable. Volumes of plastics across the globe are having a severe impact on our environment. And as Noel has mentioned this morning, we're experiencing impacts to ecosystems, fisheries, coastal tourism, human health and trade. Not only here in Australia, uh, globally of course this is a massive problem, um, but it is a particular problem for many of our close colleagues across the Pacific Island countries. Given the prevalence of plastics in the environment, it's likely that almost every marine species has encountered some form of plastic. And by 2050, uh, this is a statistic I'm sure many of you have heard many times before, it's predicted that the amount of plastic in, in our oceans will outweigh fish, causing untold harm to marine life. So there is no question that there's a problem, but I'm naturally an optimist and I'm very much looking forward to the work globally to develop this treaty on plastics action. Australia is currently taking um, pretty much unprecedented action nationally to, ma to manage plastic pollution here in our country, including by implementing the world's first and currently the world's only plastics export ban, making significant investments in new recycling infrastructure so that when we are keeping the waste here in the country, we're doing something constructive with it, and also pursuing pretty ambitious national packaging targets. We have a national plastics plan 
and that outlines how we're tackling the plastics problem, recognising that this requires multiple invention, interventions across the entire plastics life cycle, including design, use, recovery and then reuse. We're working with state and territory governments and industry to phase out problematic, unnecessary single-use plastics by 2025 or sooner. So these include lightweight plastic bags, plastic products that are misleadingly termed biodegradable, plastic straws and utensils and stirrers, expanded polystyrene food containers, uh, EPS consumer goods packaging, and microbeads in personal health products. In addition to phasing out the plastics that we don't need, we need to increase recycling rates for those plastics that are already in use in the economy and the ones that we expect to continue to, to use in coming years. To expand that recycling infrastructure and encourage, and encourage the rollout of advanced technologies, the Australian Government has been funding uh, close to $1 billion worth uh, of total leveraged investment from the Australian state, territory uh, and local governments and, and industry to increase recycling infrastructure to sort, process and remanufacture waste materials around our country. But at the end of the day, it's not just about reducing the use of plastics and it's not just about recycling plastics. Really importantly, it's also about redesigning. Product design can have a profound impact on the environmental performance of that product through its life. The OECD estimates that about 80% of a product's environmental footprint is locked in at the design stage. Australia's industry-led national packaging targets are also improving the design of packaging to reduce waste and improve recycling rates. Now those targets are ambitious and they include the target of 100% of our packaging in this country being reusable, recyclable or compostable by 2025. So in relation to the plastics, the Global Plastics Treaty, we recognise that Plastic pollution is a global issue that no one country can solve. Australia is committed to being a leading partner in the global fight to solve plastic pollution. And at the UNEA Assembly earlier this year, Australia fully supported the launch of negotiations for a new global treaty to end plastic pollution. We will play an active role in negotiations to ensure that amb an ambitious mandate is set and we are really looking forward to participating in the first intergovernmental inter negotiating committee meeting in November this year. Our priority is that the treaty covers the full life cycle of plastics. It should cover plastic pollution from all sources, including marine plastic pollution, micro and nanoplastics, and any harmful chemicals used during design and production. We advocate a circular economy approach. We need to keep finite resources in use, in circulation, for as long as possible. The treaty should also include mechanisms for considering and avoiding perverse outcomes, such as unsustainable substitutes for plastic. And that really is a risk that we are starting to see emerge. The pace at which we're phasing out plastics requires a huge amount of global cooperation to make sure that what we're replacing them with doesn't lead to any worse environmental outcome. The treaty should take an evidence-based approach and it should provide transparent, clear guidance to the global community. It will be important for the treaty too to complement existing international frameworks, such as international chemicals treaties and regional action plans. We don't want to see an in inconsistent approach emerging uh, to address plastic pollution. Frankly, I don't think we have the time for that. But this Global Treaty on Plastic Pollution can provide a unifying guide for all of us to work together towards ending plastic pollution. So mindful of time, I will wrap up there and I look forward to participating in some questions from you later. But I do want to uh, just re-emphasise that addressing plastic pollution is a, a real priority for the Australian Government and we look forward to working with Ecuador uh, and the rest of our international partners to develop the new Plastics Treaty. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kate. Of course, uh, 
national action only tackles one part of the equation. Regardless of how well some governments perform in terms of eliminating plastic pollution within their own borders, unless all countries act together in concert, many of them will have to continue to deal with the plastic pollution of other countries. This is particularly so in the case of the small island states of the Pacific, which contribute as little as 1.3% to global plastic pollution, yet are on the front line of the plastic crisis and are disproportionately impacted by it. Dr. Sasha Fuller draws on over 15 years of research and field experience in the Pacific and is the Pacific Engagement Consult Coordinator with the Newcastle Institute for Energy and Resources. Uh, I think Sasha is well placed, therefore, to give us a Pacific perspective. And as an aside, let, re let me remind you all that the Pacific does not stop at the Rio Grande River and resume at Cape Horn. There are actually 11 literal Latin American states that are also Pacific states. So, Sasha, the questions that I hope you'll be able to touch on are, is plastic pollution a priority for the Pacific countries? Is it regarded by the island states themselves as a priority? Do they have the capacity to develop and implement policies to reduce or eliminate plastic pollution? Many of us have heard, uh, including in my own reading for the, the meeting this morning, the giant accumulation of plastic known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'd be interested to know how big is it? What's its impact? And is anything being done about it? And there, are there other garbage patches elsewhere in the Pacific or indeed uh, the, the oceans? So, Sasha, let me pass the floor to you. Thank you, Noel, Ambassador, Minister, distinguished guests. Um, thank you for having me here today. Thank you for ANCLAS for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here on Nungwal country. I would like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land whose sovereignty was never ceded. I pay my deep respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, just before we get started, I am an environmental anthropologist. I was one of 17 scientists who put together a scientist declaration on the importance of a governance of plastics along their full life cycle that was submitted before UNEA 5.2. Um, now with a, a number of collaborators, actors and scientists throughout the world, we are putting together um, an international scientists network. Um, so Minister, you'd be very interested in that to help inform the process for you and I'll be happy to circulate more information on that once it's launched. But today I'm going to present findings from our plastic pollution prevention policy research in the Pacific region. My aim here, I've just got to get myself organised, sorry, I've got too many things going on. Um, my aim here is to highlight why the Pacific region needs a global plastics treaty and why it will be important for Pacific countries to maintain high ambition during the first critical meeting of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee in Uruguay in November. It's here where the objectives, the definitions and the program of work on the treaty to end plastics pollution will be decided. So why does the Pacific need a global treaty to end plastics pollution? Despite their known harms, the rate of toxic plastics production and consumption is accelerating. Currently, 368 million metric tonnes of virgin plastics is produced annually, and this is set to double by 2040. 90% of the plastics that we currently produce end up leached into our environment. If we carry on business as usual, this will culminate to 1.1 billion tonnes having entered the world oceans by 2030. That's eight years from now. Pacific Island nations are grossly and disproportionately impacted precisely because their territory is comprised mostly of ocean. The ocean makes up 98% of the region, only 2% is land. 
Pacific Island peoples, like many uh, small island developing states, have close cultural, economic and social ties to the ocean. Yet this is threatened by the transboundary movement of plastics and the socio-cultural, environmental, economic and human health impacts of plastics that are the result. As Noel said, Pacific nations contribute as little as 1.3% of global plastic production and do not produce plastic polymers. And yet they have the requ highest recorded quantity of floating plastics in the South Pacific subtropical gyre, the Pacific garbage patch. I don't know how big it is exactly, sorry. You'll have to Google that. Our research shows that addressing the transboundary movement of plastics that is the plastics that come into the region through tidal flows and ocean currents, yes, we know about that, but also from the fishing industry, from trade, in the guise of food and beverages, that's how it's coming in, packaging and tourism is a major concern for Pacific leaders and highlights the major problem of plastics pollution as an interjurisdictional issue. Foreign external actors, corporations, industry, governments, have so far, in many cases, been unwilling to address the problem of transboundary flows of plastics pollution into the Pacific region. While there are some examples of the transnational companies and industry doing good and great things, as Kate has highlighted, others are making decisions that exacerbate the plastics crisis for Pacific nations. Coca-Cola Amatil, for example, who consistently do top the ban list report for the world's worst plastic polluters, stopped distributing glass bottles in Samoa while I was there in favour of plastic ones in May 2021, with immediate and devastating impacts for the local environment. By citing geographic constraints and small economies of scale, corporations such as Coca-Cola restrict preventative mechanisms such as backloading for Pacific nations. Backloading or reverse logistics is a supply chain mechanism that ensures post-consumption plastics are returned to the point of production. For example, filling empty shipping containers with plastic waste and repatriating it for safe and environmentally responsible management. As policy frameworks currently stand, companies and governments can ship products into the Pacific but not take the plastic pollution back out. They are not currently held accountable for finding a solution. The disposal of the pollution that they ship into the region then relies on stockpiling, then landfilling, burning or dumping locally, further impacting the small land areas, the environment, the ocean and the health of Pacific peoples. Pacific nations are currently ill-equipped to manage the costly and harmful impacts of this problem, which is huge in magnitude and externally generated. Like in much of the world, current efforts to minimise plastics in the Pacific are almost entirely focused on pollution management, rather than on turning off the tap, stopping it at the source. That is, on the prevention or reduction of the production of problematic plastics and toxic plastic chemicals. Progress has been made in the region, for example, through the implementation of single-use plastic bans in 14 countries. However, the policy deficit here is not with the Pacific region. The scale of the issue is global and therefore cannot be dealt with national or regional policy frameworks alone. A global issue requires a global response. And where capacity, resources, infrastructure are limited, the most powerful mechanisms to prevent problematic plastics entering the region in the first place and staying there, or turning off the tap for the Pacific, as the artwork from the UNEA 5.2 meeting in Nairobi suggests, can only be regulated at the international level. And yet from our research, Pacific nations have little agency over outcomes in these spaces. That is, they have li limited access to meaningfully participate in global fora. It's why their participation in the INC process is so crucial. The Pacific position is at stake. The priorities, needs, definitions and diversity of Pacific Island nations must be included in the INC process and program of work. While there are many terms that will be need, need to be defined through the INC process, the life cycle of plastics is one of the most important and will be a highly contested battleground. 
This is largely because 99% of plastics are produced from fossil fuels and the life cycle of plastics is really an extension of the fossil fuel life cycle. While it's clear that the life cycle of plastic ends with pollution in the environment, where it begins is what will be contested for the purposes of the agreement. Given plastics production is estimated to produce more than 1.8 gigatons of greenhouse gases each year, plastic pollution is a threat multiplier that has the potential to exacerbate climate change and biodiversity loss, issues that are already of critical importance to Pacific Island nations. The Pacific position then is more closely aligned to a definition of life, life cycle that starts upstream at extraction. Plastics producers and countries that produce plastics and provide oil and gas may be more likely to argue for a midstream definition. If the midstream definition wins over, Pacific Island nations will not be protected from the harmful environmental and human health impacts of plastics. Once produced, that is, released into the environment, plastics never disappear. The fact that they have an end of life is, is not a fact. Um, rather, they just degrade into other physical and chemical forms. They leach into our environment and have led to the contamination of all bio, biophysical systems. Toxic plastics-related chemicals and nano and microplastics contaminate our food, our soil, our marine and freshwater sources, air and the bodies of humans and animals. Plastics do present hazards to human health all along the supply chain. Their endocrine disrupting chemicals can interfere with gene expression inter and transgenerationally. Inhalation and ingestion of and skin contact with microplastics and nanoplastics, toxic chemicals and add additives affect all our human systems. The latest science shows microplastics are found in our blood, our lungs, our placenta, our fetuses. This is of particular concern to Pacific peoples. Microplastics have been found in 65% of commonly consumed fish in the Pacific, and it's thought that that figure is now under, underrepresented. Um, Pacific people do rely on healthy fish stocks for their primary source of protein, with approximately 110 kilograms of fish consumed per capita per year, meaning that plastic toxins are undoubtedly being transmitted to consumers. Yet there is no regulation of microplastics and the long-term elimination of discharges in the region or elsewhere. The scientific evidence shows unequivocally that plastics pollution threatens food security and safety, human health, and the very new human right to a healthy environment. There is also currently no legal basis for loss or damage in relation to economic development, such as impacts on tourism, and there is definitely none for the impact, the loss and damage on Pacific culture and livelihoods, the relationship to land, the relationship to ocean. The challenges faced by Pacific countries are compounded by a lack of best practice by the international science community in working alongside local communities to one, co-develop the question and identify the problem, to involve local communities in multiple sectors of the science and to incorporate indigenous science frameworks into the research. More science by the region for the region is needed. In terms of the mandate of the INC promotion or um, the understanding of indigenous alternatives to plastics and indigenous led responses to plastic pollution are important considerations. In the first INC meeting then, it will be crucial to ensure that the program of work decided upon is organised in such a way to ensure that core Pacific priorities have sufficient and dedicated space for discussion. Rwanda's submission here to the INC would allow that. Saudi Arabia's, which is based on very downstream management, would not allow that space for Pacific Island nations. This is going to be another great contest at the INC. Pacific Island nations are currently making their own submission to UNEP on what they would like their program of work to be. 
In conclusion, our research shows the policy gaps and highlights a shared set of external pressures preventing Pacific Island leaders from being able to effectively respond to plastics pollution in their countries and region. It's leaders from the Pacific region who are best able to define the problem of plastics pollution across the region. These leaders have drawn attention to where the responsibility for preventing and managing plastics waste should lie, at the top of the waste hierarchy, with plastics producers, transnational corporations and trading partners from higher GDP countries, rather than where it currently lies, solely with Pacific communities. Extraordinary efforts to transform the global plastics economy are needed. We are now at a historic moment. We can negotiate a legally binding global plastics treaty. That's a pretty great position to be in. And the strength of it will rely on the high ambition input from countries most impacted, such as Pacific Island nations. Thank you. There is a video there. I can circulate that. I think we're out of time. Thank you. This underlines the need to uh, resort to new technologies uh, all the time. So thank you very much, Kate and Sasha, for giving us a sense of the legal and policy challenges posed by plastic pollution from an Australian perspective and from a Pacific perspective. It's now my privilege to give the floor to our keynote speaker, Ambassador Luis Vallas, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Ecuador. Ambassador Vallas draws on almost 30 years of public service, including with the Office of the Ecuadorian Presidency and the Foreign Ministry. He served overseas at Ecuadorian missions in Stockholm, in Geneva, and in Madrid, during which he's held senior positions at conferences of parties of several multilateral environmental instruments. He's also served as Chief of Staff to the Foreign Minister and took up his current position as Deputy Foreign Minister in March of this year. Deputy Minister, we look forward to your providing us an Ecuadorian perspective, not only Ecuador's domestic approaches to plastic pollution, but also drawing on your experience in the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, your expectations concerning the scope of a global agreement on plastic pollution. Will it include quantitative targets? Will it include global mechanisms to incentivize a circular economy? Will it contain methodologies for national reporting for on plastic pollution? Will it contain a funding mechanism for developing countries to build new infrastructure for reducing plastic pollution? The sorts of challenges that are particularly evident in small countries such as the island countries that Sasha mentioned in her presentation. So Minister, with those uh, parameters, it's my great pleasure to give you the floor. Good morning, you at all. It's really nice and a privilege to be here at the University, Australian National University. Uh, and thank you, Director, Ambassadors, colleagues. Uh, this morning we have, I think, one of the most uh, important meetings I have had since I started working with uh, plastic pollution issues or matters. Because we met a high-level scientific group from Australia and uh, to hear the insights to match with our needs for these uh, negotiations of the Treaty of Plastic Pollution, it was really, really good to hear and also to see and try to work on how we can implement this treaty, but well, first how we can negotiate a uh, yes, ambitious, robust, effective treaty, and then also to get a uh, treaty that can be implemented, but also an ambitious treaty that our countries could have to implement 
and tackle plastic pollution at the national and regional level. Uh, I would like, before we go into the, the discussions about the treaty and how we see the scope and how we see the process of negotiation, I would like to speak to you uh, about some backgrounds. Uh, how do we get to the po point that we are now facing this negotiation? Well, one of the uh, most important uh, events that happened before we start with the negotiation of the treaty is the adoption of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, SDG number 14, where we agree among our, uh, the countries at the UN nations to conserve uh, the oceans, seas, and marine resources. And I would like to tell you that Ecuador was very active in those negotiations to adopt the SDGs. And this was 2015. And two, no, three, uh, yes, three years later, also, I have to mention that Ecuador was the first country to mention also the need of an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. We already heard a lot about it. We already heard the need of having these negotiations and having this convention uh, from, from NGOs, from civil society, from different actors. But as a country, we did so during a conference of the parties of the Basel Convention. I was also a member of the Bureau in, in the Basel Convention, and then we mentioned uh, this need. And since then, we saw a movement among us, among the countries, I mean about the countries, among the states, working towards this uh, negotiation and working towards an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. And that's why also we, uh, yes, well, you see the next one. We uh, work with some countries, for instance, at different international organizations. I was uh, also in a uh, working in our permanent mission in Geneva. I was appointed in, in our mission in Geneva to the UN. And that was some years ago, tw uh, yes, 2005 to 2010. And those days, it was difficult to find these matters being uh, discussed, being debated outside of the United Nations. And for instance, at WTO, at, at the WTO, World Trade Organization, we did have this Committee on Trade and Environment. But trade was the center of the discussions. Environment, yes, was something there that we should look at, but trade, it was the most important. Of course, you know, it's the WTO. Nowadays, at WTO, the same organization, we are discussing about plastic pollution. We have the informal dialogue on plastic pollution, Australia, Ecuador, Sweden, and other countries. We are talking about this, and we are coordinating with some countries this dialogue. Now we have almost 80 countries, part of this uh, dialogue, and we hope that more countries will be participating in these discussions. Uh, another important issue, it was also a conference, a ministerial conference, uh, also in 2020, uh, 2020, where we start discussing among different states, different countries, the need of this, of this treaty. Also, Ecuador was leading this negotiations of this uh, declaration. Uh, we have heard, we have heard this morning also from Sasha, from Kate, how about plastic pollution is. I was, I was telling this morning with the, with the global scientists that we should freak out. It is really dangerous what we are having. It's like putting a plastic bag around the world and closing it. We are suffocating, we are stopping our world to breathe. And we need to work, and we need to work fast. That's why we celebrate when we took the decision in UNEA 5.2 in the uh, UN Environmental Assembly in Nairobi last March. We took, uh, I will come to that too, we took the decision to start negotiating a, a treaty. And that was really a big step. We should celebrate that decision that we took because we have problems like we, it has been mentioned, but I just would like to emphasize, you know, 11 million of metric tons coming into our oceans, of plastic coming into our oceans every year. Uh, about recycling, 
we've been discussing a lot about recycling the, the past many years. It is good, it's not bad to recycle, but it's not a solution. Definitely is not a solution, because if it was a solution, we should have solved the problem. But this, the problem is not solved, actually is increasing the problem of plastic pollution. As we have heard this morning too, we have a lot of plastic on the oceans, we have dispatched this plastic islands, actually, I don't know the size either, but we are talking about maybe the size of a French uh, territory, like uh, German, uh, the, the size of Germany, for instance, in these islands. And we have five of those in the oceans. And they are increasing too. Yes, it was said this morning, we will, in some years, 2050, maybe even before, we will have more plastic than fish in the ocean. And we are talking about articles, not nano and, and microplastics. We say too that, it, and it was mentioned by, by Sasha, I took a picture of your, your slide because it was very clear picture of what we eat. We are eating plastic and it's not for, <laughs> plastic is bad, but if it's even worse, the chemicals that are in the plastic. We are eating some chemicals that are persistent in our body, in our blood, in our brain. We say that, calculating to what Sasha said, that we eat the equivalent of a plastic credit card every week, one of us, every one of us. We eat the equivalent of a credit card per week we are putting into our organisms. And yes, plastic is bad, chemicals are bad, they are persistent pollutants, and I was talking, uh, you know, I've been working with these issues for, for some years. I've been also participating in the negotiation of Stockholm Conventions about uh, uh, organic persistent pollutants, the POPs, and uh, I was talking to a scientist of one of these organizations, the WIPEN, and he was telling me that not persistent pollutants are also as bad as the persistent pollutants. Because, for instance, yes, in us, in adults, we, talk, we take those pollutants into our bodies and we eliminate, but for children and for young and, uh, and, and babies, it's very bad because these even not persistent pollutants, they damage the brain, they damage the blood, and we are eating those through plastics. A species, yes, it's bad for the human health and it's really bad for the environment. You know, we have the Galapagos Islands. One of our symbols in the Galapagos Islands are the turtles. And 80%, not only Galapagos, in the whole world, 80% of the marine turtles are affected because of plastic pollution. 50% of marine mammals are affected because of plastic pollution. 50% of marine birds are affected with plastic pollution. And we believe that even more than 800 species around the world are already affected because of plastic pollution. We need to do something, and we need to do something very fast. I'm going back. Then we come to a historical moment, as I said. March second this year in Nairobi, UNEA 5.2, we adopt this resolution. 175 countries, we agreed that we need a legally binding international instrument to combat plastic pollution. And as I said, this was a historical moment. We have had negotiations, we have had uh, debates and also agreements in other organizations. We have Basel Convention, that is about uh, the movements of hazardous ways. We have the Stockholm Convention, about, I was talking to you about the POPs, about the persistent organic pollutants. And we have Rotterdam Conventions about prior informed consent procedures uh, for chemicals. And there's a lot of work done already in some conventions. Because I tell you, here, even though this is a great moment for history to combat plastic pollution, also we are facing some challenges. And one of the most important challenges is that we don't have too much time to negotiate. We have a bit more than two years, because it, it has been mentioned too by the, the director, that we need to present a draft document, a draft uh, treaty for the end of 2024. And we should adopt the convention, we should adopt the treaty at the beginning of 2025. 
for negotiations of this type, when we negotiate Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm Convention, when we negotiate also Minamata Convention on Mercury, it took, as I was mentioning also this morning, I think uh, uh, Minamata Convention on Mercury took uh, four and a half years, and that's fast. Usually it takes seven, eight, ten, even more years to negotiate a convention. So time is not our best ally at the moment. But at the same time, many, a lot of work is already done in different conventions, in different organizations, at the national level. We have, <coughs> sorry, we have heard this morning what Australia is doing at the national level, what Ecuador is doing at the national level. We have a circular economy uh, legislation. We have a single-use plastic to, to, to stop single-use plastics legislation. We do take care and have special rules and regulations for Galapagos Islands. We work at the, inter at the regional level with other South American countries, with Colombia, uh, Panama, and Costa Rica. We have signed an agreement about the uh, marine corridors. Uh, we are working to the south of, with the same uh, purposes. Australia is working at the regional level very high. So they, they are having a, a leading, a leading uh, role here at the, uh, at the region, but it's not enough. Those efforts at national, regional level are not enough. We need a global solution because we have a global problem. Because we could stop completely from Ecuador, for instance, plastic pollution in Galapagos Island. But we will still receive plastic from, from the, with the marine currents coming into the Galapagos, coming from other places, coming from the ships, from big boats, <clears throat> that are fishing in international waters. So uh, still the problem will be there. So we need to have this uh, global uh, solution. About the Ecuador, and how we see it, and how we approach the, <clears throat> how we approach the, the, the negotiation, it, it, it has been said here, at the moment we are members of the uh, INC, the Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee, that was established by this UN resolution in Nairobi. At the beginning, we agreed that we will be 11 uh, countries, 11 members at the Bureau. You know, at the UN, at the United Nations, we have five regional groups. Well, we work usually with these five regional groups. And we have GRULAC, that is the Latin American and the Caribbean group. We have the African group. We have the Asian Pacific group. We have Eastern European group. And we have Western Europe plus other countries, other groups uh, group. And with these five groups, we decide that each of us, each of these regional groups, will designate two delegates per region. But again, you know, we, we hear from, from Sasha how important the small islands or state islands are. And we heard also in New York that seeds, the small islands, developing states, had this interest in participating in this kind of negotiations, for instance, in plastic pollution, where they have a lot to say, a lot to contribute, and, and they are, because they are suffering a lot because of this, they, they have this interest in participating directly. So we support, as Ecuador, we support from the very beginning the interest of the seeds of the small islands developing the state in participating also in the Bureau of the INC. That's why we are not 10 members anymore. We are 11 members and we celebrate, we, con we congratulate ourselves for having also one more member and that's, in this case, is already designated. It will be Antigua and Barbuda, uh, also participating in the, in the Bureau in the negotiations of the INC. To be in the Bureau, yes, it is important, but also we will negotiate with all the countries because all the countries are part, all the UN countries, we are part of the INC. So it's important, the negotiation we do at the regional level, at bilateral level, we've been talking with Australia yesterday, for instance, and this morning too, that how we could work together between Ecuador and Australia, for instance, with focusing with our interest in the negotiation. And our interest, Australia, Ecuador interests, actually are the interests of the whole world. It's almost the same interest. We have different points of view, how to go, but we have, we share same interests. And, and that's in, Good is, is, is really uh, good in, in the way that it will be easier to negotiate 
than when we negotiate other treaties. I don't want to mention areas, but going to you know, labor or going to intellectual property, I don't know what, is that will be, in this case, easier. Because we do have, we do have a common interest. Yes, as I said, you know, we have different points of view. In the beginning, some, some uh, countries uh, were mentioning that we should focus in recycling. It was mentioned also in, in one of our slides, or such, such as slides. Uh, other countries we have mentioned from the very beginning that we need to think about the whole life cycle of plastics because that's important. This negotiation is not about plastic. It's about plastic pollution. It's to combat plastic pollution. But we need to talk about the whole life cycle of plastics. We need to talk about uh, produce uh, uh, production. We need to talk about transport. We, yes, we need to talk about design. We need to talk about the standards that we need because of chemicals too. We should stop uh, using chemicals that are already forbidden, that are already banned because uh, they are listed in the Stockholm Convention. But sometimes we find some of those chemicals are still in plastics. That shouldn't happen. Uh, to implement the treaty, it's important to have this, what we have called the five Cs. Coordination, collaboration, cooperation, consensus, and compromises. Not only to implement, but also to, to negotiate the treaty. We are really focusing that we should have global commitments. And as I said, we have only two years to negotiate this. So the three, the three first ones, coordination, collaboration, and cooperation, are quite important from the very beginning. Because we need to work with other organizations, with other conventions, with the Stockholm, Rotterdam, and Basel conventions, for instance. We need to work with WHO. Already there is a lot of discussions, a lot of agreements because of health issues at the World Health Organization. We need to work also with WTO, because as I, as I mentioned before, the, the informal dialogue on plastics is, is advancing quite well. We need to work also with NGOs. NGOs are so important. They have already a lot of work. The, the NGOs that uh, Sasha works with, for instance, that, that they were mentioned also in her presentation, they have contributed a lot already, and they have a lot to keep contributing to the process and to the treaty. And one for me is the most important area that we need to work with, and, they, and we need their contribution, is the academia and the scientific community. Without the scientific community, we won't go too far. Diplomats, yes, we are able to negotiate. We should be good at negotiations. But we don't know anything, everything. Actually, we yes, we need to negotiate, but we need data, we need information, we need uh, have good documents. Uh, and those documents, we have already we have a lot. We have a lot of documents, we have a lot of information, but we need the correct ones. We need impartial information. We need, because sometimes we say, you know, numbers, we give percentage, and sometimes they, they are not the same. We are a bit confused sometimes because uh, even, even when they come from, from a source that we think that is a correct source, it could be a wrong number. So we need to go to the correct, to, to correct sources. We need to work with this scientific community, and we need to appoint and we need to establish a group that will gather scientific community. Uh, I was mentioning also this morning, I don't have an answer exactly how we should do that. I have a proposal. I have a proposal, yes. The first, the base of the proposal is that we need this group. We can call it working group, committee, whatever. But we need a group of scientists, of academia, of scientific community, working with us, contributing, giving us the information. How do we establish that group is another question. Again, I don't have a straight answer. I have a proposal. We think, we believe that yes, this is a member-driven negotiation. We are the countries we are negotiating, the UN countries we are going to negotiate in the INC. But sometimes, you know, to, to have the correct people in the correct places, like in this committee, for instance, in the scientific uh, committee, we need also experts to do so. Because if we, the governments, put uh, our uh, uh, delegates, our experts, sometimes we can make mistakes. You know, because again, we are the government, 
We are not the institutions, we are not the, the universities that know exactly where to go, what doors to knock to have the correct people. So maybe we, the governments, the delegates, the countries, should delegate this task to a university, to a scientific institute, to a research institute that could nominate these uh, scientists. It shouldn't be too big. We believe that it should be a group of five, between five and ten people, max. And uh, we've been thinking also to look at the IPCC for, when we're talking about climate change. But the IPCC at the same time is quite big. We have a lot of scientists all around the world connected among them, but maybe it's too big. But also the idea could be, for instance, to delegate this task to the IPCC to ask them to help us creating, establishing this group. That's another idea. Uh, about implementation, and I will try to be very short with this. Uh, yes, we need the global commitments on one side, global uh, agreements, global compromises is one of the C's for what we need to do concessions. That's quite normal in the, in the negotiation. Is we shouldn't go just with our a position and we should be un unflexible. No, we have to be flexible. We need to talk to all the stakeholders. We need to talk to the private sector. Private sector is so important. They need to contribute. We need to talk to them. We need to agree with them to bring also their contributions to the negotiations. So that should be global. But that global uh, agreements, that treaty has to be implemented at the national level, also at the regional level, but at the national level. We need also implementation of national plans. And for that, we need two specific uh, matters to be discussed from the very beginning, at least for developing countries like Ecuador or like rural countries, the Latin American and the Caribbean group. It's very important that from the very beginning, we talk about financial mechanisms, how we are going to tackle the implementation national plans without financial mechanisms, it will be difficult. One thing is that we can work with uh, these transnational enterprises, that they have the money to implement new ways of producing, having or taking into account plastic pollution, and they could change their, mach their machines, they could change their methods, and fine, of course it's a big investment, but also is a benefit later on for them. But in our countries, with the small companies, with the small enterprises, with medium-sized enterprises, they cannot do that. They don't have the money, for instance, to change the whole uh, factory or to change some machines to produce different. So we need a financial mechanisms to implement the treaty. And we need compliance mechanisms too. That will be the second one. It was mentioned here, we need to comply. You know, if, if we commit a crime, if we commit a uh, we do something wrong at the national level. Yes, we have the police, we have our legislation side, but at the international level, we don't. We have to fulfill, of course, what we sign. We need to fulfill what we sign. But we need also compliance mechanisms. And we have experience. We have experience at the Stockholm, Rotterdam, and Basel Convention. I think we should follow. We have also the Paris Agreement on climate change. But I'm not too... Uh, convinced that we should go that way. We cannot have only or mainly voluntary measures. And we see what's happening with climate change. I don't need to tell you. So we need to have legally binding instrument, robust, ambitious legally binding instrument, but also we need those mechanisms, financial mechanisms and compliance mechanisms to implement it at the national level. Uh, again, coming back to Ecuador, I have to tell you that our, our uh, participation and in international organizations, we've been quite active about the environment in general and about plastic pollution in particular, also thinking of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the beginning of this year, in uh, January, and we announced it in, the, in Glasgow in the COP26, we enlarged the marine reserve of the Galapagos Islands. We had before around 130,000 uh, square kilometers of the marine reserve, and we enlarge and we uh, add 60,000 uh, more square kilometers to the marine reserve. So we have almost 200,000 now. 
uh, to 200,000 square kilometers. It's a huge effort for Ecuador. It's a huge area to be controlled, and we need international cooperation to control. These things, environmental matters, are not only the responsibility of a country. It's the responsibility of the whole world, and that's why we are working also with this, with many countries, with a lot of countries. It was really nice to see the response when we present this uh, uh, marine reserve about Galapagos in Glasgow, and also I talk about it in Lisbon uh, in the UN Ocean uh, Summit. The response from, from not only from other countries that could help us to, to, to preserve the islands, but also for uh, financial institutions and from NGOs and different foundations that they are going to cooperate to keep the, the, the marine reserve in the Galapagos Islands. And to finish, I would like to tell you about a specific interest of our country. Uh, we've been talking, and I will be very happy to answer questions, to hear your comments. We were talking about this uh, treaty, the negotiation of this treaty to combat plastic pollution. We think it will be a very important treaty, and we would like to call it the Galapagos Treaty. That's why uh, this month, in the General Assembly at New York, our president will announce and present officially the request or the interest of having of, and hosting the diplomatic conference in 2025 in Ecuador. And we would like that this treaty will be signed in Galapagos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, I have a, uh, a practical suggestion to make that the three speakers uh, take a seat here so that we can uh, confront or uh, respond to the audience. And uh, we'll use this uh, roving microphone in order to, to respond. Uh, Maria, do we also have a microphone for uh, people in the audience to address questions? Right. Uh, many thanks again, Deputy Minister, for that uh, presentation. I think and hope you've provoked us to um, ask a few questions. Um, perhaps I can uh, break the ice. Uh, you mentioned, and I know in the expert meeting we had before this one, a number of existing conventions that deal uh, in part with the question of uh, plastic pollution. Uh, these include the Marpole Convention, the London Dumping Convention. You've mentioned that the conventions uh, with um, important capitals as their, their descriptors, the Stockholm Convention, the Basel Convention, the Rotterdam Convention. My question is, is there a risk that by negotiating a new instrument, we are overlooking the possibility of plugging the gaps that exist in existing instruments or is the case so compelling that we need a new and additional instrument? And again, Kate, you might want to respond to this as, as you will be um, one of the practitioners that have to deal with it. If there is to be a reporting mechanism under the new convention, that will of course be an additional to the national reporting mechanism under the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biodiversity, the Convention on the Ozone Layer, the uh, uh, Convention on Desertification. Is there a risk also at the level of practitioners in governments of reporting fatigue? So I'm simply asking this as a devil's advocate, if you will. Perhaps, Minister, if you could address the question of whether there's a need for a new instrument or whether plugging the gaps in existing instruments might be an alternative. And Kate, if you could talk about the um, potential risk of uh, reporting fatigue. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very, very good question. And the, the first answer is yes. We need, a particular, we need a specific convention to tackle uh, plastic pollution. Because you said, there are many other conventions, there are many other instruments, and uh, uh, we've been discussing this in many different international organizations. We have already agreements, like in the three conventions that I mentioned in, uh, about chemicals, for instance, Stockholm, Rotterdam, and Basel Convention, but they 
also we work with other that are not particularly plastic. For instance, to mention the plastic dimension, we talk about e-waste to other electronic waste, but uh, we need a particular, we need a specific convention to tackle plastic pollution because the, the danger, the, the problem that we have is also quite, quite big. And again, how we do it, we know, we know that we need, and I was talking about if I see, you know, we need this coordination, collaboration and cooperation with them, but it's easy to say, <laughs> now we have to do it. And uh, that, that's not that easy, we need to coordinate with them, we need to talk with the different secretariats about uh, the, the contribution, we need to agree among the countries how that contribution is going to come into the, the negotiations, into the INC, and of course, you know, we are talking, we are talking with the, about conventions that are in the UN system, but still, uh, coordination and uh, uh, cooperation with them is, is, is very important. And so, we need also to discuss about how that link will be. Also, what, what to take. Of course, we have to take all the agreements that we have already about plastic and about plastic pollution and to bring them into, the, into our negotiations. <laughs> Uh, yes, thanks, Noel. Um, well, one reflection I have is that um, we, I was mentioning this to the Ambassador yesterday, we, uh, within the Federal Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, uh, in my division, have um, engagement and responsibility across uh, a number of those important um, treaties. Uh, so certainly in relation to the Basel, Stock Stockholm, Rotterdam conventions, um, the, the, the practitioners, as you mentioned, uh, all work together very closely and I do uh, just want to emphasise um, my agreement with uh, the Ambassador's comments there about the need for the Global Plastics Treaty to um, build upon and interact with and, and link with uh, to complement uh, the work that's undertaken in those other spaces. Um, you asked about reporting fatigue. Um, I don't know anybody who works in any large organisation anywhere who would not say that there is a degree of reporting fatigue but uh, in this instance it's my reflections on this are that plastics has have become such a rapidly evolving and rapidly growing problem that data and evidence is increasingly important and in fact I can't see us being effective in a solution unless we are better gathering that data and evidence. Uh, one of the particular issues that we face in Australia is knowledge of uh, the specifics of where plastics are in our economy and how they move through the economy. So we tend to talk about that in terms of a traceability framework. Uh, and that will be an important component uh, in the discussions around the Global Plastics Treaty because uh, we can make, we can set targets, but unless we're actually able to verify uh, and report upon those targets, then um, we are aware of risk essentially of greenwashing or, or sort of, you know, bluffing. We can also work towards phasing out um, dangerous chemicals in plastics, uh, and that's a really, really important element if we are, you know, trying to maintain plastics by recycling them uh, and reusing them in a circular economy. But knowing exactly what's gone into the, the plastics in the first place um, becomes critically important, so that then you can be confident about a safe reuse. So I, I do think that the establishment of reporting frameworks in this instance will actually be um, probably more significant and more important than in many other of those uh, international treaties. That's great. Thank you. Can I check the audience then? Are there any um, uh, questions that you'd like to pose to our, our three speakers? Oh, sorry. Yes. I can't recognise you because of your mask. Sorry. Oh, Maximo. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm Maxim Gunn from Argentina. Uh, uh, quick question, perhaps to just further develop on, on what you were just talking about. And, and by the way, thank you to, to all three speakers for their presentation. Uh, is there anything specifically being considered uh, regarding the, the Antarctic region? Um, and or, or perhaps how to address the issue in Antarctica or how to engage with the Antarctic Treaty System. Is this something that is being considered because plastic pollution is something that is already uh, uh, in, in observation under the Antarctic Treaty System? And I was just wondering, is, if in this process, has there been any consideration as to 
how to engage with the Antarctic Treaty System specifically. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me pass the microphone to uh, the Deputy Minister. Uh, we might ask you at the end of his answer to give us a bit of insight about what is occurring in the context of the Antarctic Treaty to see uh, uh, what scope there is indeed for, for aligning the two uh, treaty processes. Definitely. Uh, the Antarctic Treaty we have to take also into our negotiations. The, 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 what we have already agreed to preserve the Antarctic and the purposes that we want to countries in the Antarctic. And we found plastics in the Antarctic. There's already scientific evidence that there's plastic there. Nanoplastics, microplastics, as we have found also the same to the deepest places in the oceans and to the summit of Everest. So it's all over. So that's why also the treaty and our negotiations and then the convention should also address not only the Antarctic, but the whole the whole uh, world. And, and the, the, the resolution emphasizes that, uh, yes, we are going to negotiate and we are going to agree on this international binding instrument and focusing on, oh, it says, mainly uh, about uh, also marine environment. So marine environment is also uh, like the main uh, focusing on plastic pollution is always in the air, on the earth. So uh, what, what we, of course, we need to take into consideration. It's not any particular mention to the Antarctic, but of course, you know, it, it has to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could put the question back to you, Ambassador Galland. Uh, Ambassador Galland was the former, in, 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 prior to coming to Australia, was the head of the Antarctic Division of the Foreign Ministry in, in, in Argentina and involved in a number of the negotiations there. Has plastic been expressly addressed under the framework of the Antarctic Treaty, or is it lumped together with uh, environmental waste more generally? Um, thank you. Well, it, it has begun to be specifically addressed. There are uh, There is a lot of research, as, as was just being mentioned, being carried out by, by different uh, Antarctic institutes. There are papers being presented about even uh, addressing the microplastics uh, issue. But, um, so it, it is being addressed within the Antarctic Treaty System. What uh, my concern was, in, uh, very much like the, the Convention on uh, Marine Biodiversity that is being negotiated in the UN, there is an issue as to how this would be addressed within the Antarctic Treaty System because of the specific characteristics of the Antarctic Treaty System. So I, I just wanted to, to see if there was sort of some parallelism with with the way this is generating concerns with the biodiversity uh, treaty being uh, negotiated, the BBMJ treaty, yes. is, uh, and, and the way we approach this uh, new plastics treaty. But it had uh, to respond concretely to your question, Noel, it is being addressed already within the Antarctic treaty system. Great, thank you. Uh, is there another question from the audience? Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Deborah Lau from CSIRO. Um, and I have a question around the, um, the dependence on scientific principles, which um, I, I thoroughly support and commend and um, recognise that that will be informing the, um, the treaty and its goal to transition towards a circular economy for plastics. But when we come back to the question around uh, scientific evidence, we know that in the scientific community there's quite often debate about certain scientific facts or principles. So I'm just wondering how the committee are planning to address or consider that there might be different or divergent opinions on particular scientific positions. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be a difficult question to answer, but I'm very happy to pass the microphone to my uh, colleague, the, the Deputy Minister, and perhaps, uh, Sasha, if you could um, add a rejoinder about the particular challenges of injecting uh, scientific views, indeed, uh, corralling scientific data in the small uh, island countries of the Pacific who have few resources to dedicate to that sort of uh, activity. So, Vice Minister, first, and then Sasha. Thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 
from our side, we believe that we need this committee. This uh, not a uh, INC because it has already created, but parallel with working with the INC should be a group of scientists, group of experts working with the uh, with the committee. That's what we believe. We see in the resolution the possibility of doing so that we, the country, should agree that we should have this this uh, working group of. I, I think we could call it also committee of scientists contributing. And one of their jobs, among others, will be also what you said, because there is so much information. There is also sometimes information that is not uh, uh, the same from one group to another group or from some uh, institution to another institution. So that should be the work too, to have the correct information, to pass it to the negotiators, to pass it to the INC, to uh, work with the, with, with the other countries to, to agree. But uh, that's a question that we have put on the table. Uh, you know, the negotiations haven't started yet. We are talking, we, we just had uh, our first meeting, not of the INC. The first meeting of the INC will be the 28th of November. In, in Uruguay, it was mentioned here this morning too. We just had before, when we started all this, an, a, a meeting of the Open Ending Working Group, the OEWG, in Dakar. And uh, then we already had the, the stakeholders dialogue. That's another group that's uh, also working in parallel with the uh, religion of our round negotiations. But this, this group that I'm proposing is not created, it's not established yet. Is our, our proposal, and yes, one of the tasks would be what, what you mentioned to, to get the correct information to pass it to the, to the negotiations. But it, it, it is a proposal now that we, we hope and we will push that uh, it comes and, and we establish this, uh, this uh, committee to work in parallel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a huge concern for Pacific Island nations who are totally under-resourced. Under um, it's not like, you know, the Australian Department of Environment, for example. In the Pacific, you often have the same personnel working across invasive species, plastics, biodiversity loss, etc., and they have to get across these issues very quickly. So, of course, they're relying on outside experts to inform them of the latest science. And this is a huge problem, is this knowledge brokerage. And what we've seen in the Pacific Island nations is a lot of the promotion of false solutions, um, waste to energy technologies um, that aren't necessarily good and will be harmful to the environment and to human health. Um, so knowledge brokerage is a huge issue. That's one of the reasons we have tried to put together this um, scientist network on an effective plastics treaty. Um, which is, will be open to the international scientific community to be a part of, to provide the evidence-based scientists, and perhaps sometimes it is conflicting. But we think it really is important to have this network. Uh, we're seeing <coughs> the level of UNEP. Um, UNEP will be providing the packages to countries on uh, the science through a, a company called System IQ, with a long you know, with, with this group of international scientists, we did write to UNEP and Inge Anderson um, to just, with our concerns about System IQ, because they actually work for the plastics industry. It would be like William Mor you know, the cigarette company yes. doing, providing the packages on the impacts of smoking out to countries, sort of thing. So there are these concerns. It's hugely important that there is an independent international scientific community informing governments who often, the policy makers, do not have the time um, to go and research these things themselves. Thank you. Oh, can I just add one Sure, please do. Yeah. Um, Deb, it's a great question, and um, I just wanted to add that I, I do think there's potentially quite a useful role early on in the INC process for a committee to actually identify some of those core questions where there may have been conflicting evidence, where there may be a whole lot of different uh, science uh, views um, around the world. But I think articulating the problem is often the, the actual issue at hand. So we often get different answers because the problem is articulated slightly differently. Um, so I think there's potentially a role there too in, the, in this process to, to actually work out what are those core foundational things that we want a consensus scientific view on. Um, and, uh, and my hope would be that we would then be able to focus effort of the, the networks of, of scientists um, 
and, and at least be transparent uh, if there are different opinions, um, but, but hopefully, you know, all base um, our views on the same core science. Are there any additional uh, questions to put to the members of the or the speakers this morning? Uh, I, I have a question to you, um, Deborah. Uh, at the earlier meeting, we talked about, in addition to uh, commitments in a treaty, uh, policy decisions, some of the scientific and technological solutions or partial solutions to dealing with uh, plastic pollution. Uh, if there are others in the audience who are more expert than I to talk about this, that would be great as well. But you mentioned uh, uh, agents that degrade plastic. You mentioned uh, chemical solutions. You mentioned uh, the use of enzymes uh, to uh, break down plastic. Are any of these uh, uh, actual solutions? Uh, is there a lot of work going on here in Australia on those issues or in collaboration with, with other countries. Can you give us a bit of a, a, a perspective of what scientific and technological solutions there are in addition to policy and political commitments in, in a potential treaty? Um, thank you. Um, and I might pass to Vanessa uh, after this who has some direct experience uh, in, a, in a specific company that's developing a new technology. Um, but what I would say in looking toward to these new technologies, they are new. Um, we're in a transition phase as we look to new technologies to address the existing um, load of plastics that are there in the environment. Um, these technologies are really only operating at a very small scale currently and we know that commercially these new technologies tend to take years to scale up to, significant, to manage significant quantities. We know that um, through the, uh, initiatives like the Recycling Modernisation Fund, that's accelerating a lot of capacity in the recycling industry to take those um, existing plastics that can be mechanically recycled. But we know that there's an abundance of plastics that are either contaminated or um, inherently contain other materials like e-waste, which contains anti-flame retardants. You know, there's a lot of mixed packaging, um, and, but the work around designing that mixed material out will work for some, but not all. So there is a residual um, proportion of the plastic waste stream that needs to be addressed by these new technologies. Now, they are coming online, um, but the capacity within Australia and, and globally um, is really at a very early stage in order to deal with the volumes of plastic. As we know, only 9% are recycled currently. There's another 90% that needs to be dealt with. So that's an enormous transition and journey to make. So there are, as, as um, some people may be aware, a whole raft of new technologies, um, some new enzymes are being developed to degrade polymers. There's multitudes of different types of polymers. Um, there's microbes that um, have been bioengineered to be more efficient. There's even invertebrates that can be used to degrade plastics. And those invertebrates can then become um, protein sources or go into the agricultural industry. There's, so there's and that, there are only a few examples um, of a range of different technologies. A whole range of new bio-derived polymers uh, coming from agricultural waste products. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunity, um, but I think as part of the waste hierarchy, we do know that avoidance is the single most effective solution, replacements with existing materials, and then I think we come to this raft of new opportunity, which is going to take us you know, through the next decades and centuries um, as we make that transition um, overall and in a more permanent way. So I might hand over to Vanessa. Please do, and forgive me, Vanessa, it's very hard to distinguish people <laughs> behind masks. Uh, Vanessa works with a, um, a private um, sector company now that derived, as I understand it, from research here at ANU. So Vanessa, can you tell us more about enzymes and what, uh, what it involves, uh, whether it can be developed as a technology to scale, and uh, whether it has prospects of commercial viability? 
Absolutely. Um, so um, my name is Vanessa. I'm from Samsara Eco, and we're a startup company based here at the Australian National University. We're currently developing and scaling technology for the recycling of plastics using enzymes. Um, so our engineered enzymes can degrade plastic polymers down to the most basic chemical building blocks that they're made of. Um, these building blocks can then be used to make virgin quality plastic again, or even more valuable materials. Um, so our most mature process is developed for polyethylene phthalate, or PET plastic, um, which makes up the majority of packaging. Um, but we're also expanding our technology to tackle other plastics such as nylon and polyurethane as well, hopefully aiming to capture a lot of the waste from the textiles industry in addition to packaging. Um, so I guess to speak to the scalability and the commercialization of the technology like ours, um, we're currently scaling our technology for our first commercial facility, um, which we hope will be able to process 20,000 tons of plastic per year and use this as a blueprint for other facilities across Australia and the world to help tackle this problem of plastic pollution. Um, obviously, we understand, however, that emerging technologies like ours are not the whole solution. Um, but with our recycling process, we hope to create value for waste that previously had little to no value, and in doing so, create the incentive and opportunity to clean up the environment, use the plastic that we already have, and stop the production of plastic from fossil fuels, and one day support the implementation of such a plastic treaty as well. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Uh, in my role as school prefect, I'm afraid I'm going to have to close this uh, tremendously um, interesting, challenging, and uh, I think in many ways uh, uh, both satisfying and frustrating uh, discussion we've had about uh, the prospects for um, looking at global solutions to plastic pollution. So let me formally close by reiterating my thanks to you, a Deputy Minister, for enabling us to leverage off your visit uh, to compare experiences and views on how to deal with plastic pollution. We, we really appreciate your time and, and your insights. Uh, let me also thank colleagues from uh, the ANU, uh, to you Sasha from the uh, University of Newcastle, uh, you Deborah from CSIRO Melbourne, uh, we've also had participants in our earlier meeting from the Australian Academy of Science, from uh, the private sector, such as yourself, uh, uh, Vanessa, uh, and uh, diplomats, very happy to have uh, our Latin American uh, colleagues uh, present with us today, and, and in civil society groups who we all agree are absolutely critical to include in the consultation process in the lead up to uh, the formal negotiations of a treaty. I'd also like to particularly acknowledge the logistical support that has been provided by my colleague uh, Maria Mendoza from ANCLAS and from uh, Alejandro Reyes and Nicolas uh, Yacome from the Embassy of Ecuador. Your um, contributions may seem thankless, but they're not, believe me. I think the meet two meetings we've had today have gone uh, uh, absolutely smoothly. Uh, in a logistical sense and many, many thanks to your efforts. So I said at the outset of my remarks, I'd like this section, uh, I'd like this session to uh, be the start of a conversation. And I think through the uh, interventions we've heard and the contacts we've made, that uh, we may be able to continue that conversation with experts uh, in Ecuador, in, in Australia, in Latin America more generally. Uh, and I'm absolutely certain that through that process, uh, all parties will, will benefit. Uh, I made an attempt at the earlier meeting we had to uh, summarize by simply citing seven words that, that might uh, summarize, if you like, the outcomes or the main points of the interventions that we've heard uh, just for fun. Let me uh, repeat those and see if you come away with uh, similar impressions as myself. I guess I'd preface the seven words by saying I was uh, 
immensely impressed by your comment, uh, Deputy Minister, that uh, we should freak out. We should. It's a serious issue. It affects us all. I was astounded to hear that um, I might be ingesting the uh, equivalent of a credit card once a week of plastic particles if I continue to eat as I currently eat. Uh, I think that's definitely a wake-up call for us all as individuals, as regions, as countries, uh, as a global community to do something. So yeah, let's freak out. The seven words I mentioned this morning were integrated. It's critical that there be an integrated approach. Uh, yes, we have to stop at the source. Yes, we have to stop plastics entering the uh, waterways. Yes, we have to uh, involve scientists. Yes, we have to uh, educate the public. And yes, we need to consult uh, widely in our various uh, societies. The second word was compliance. It's well and good to have fine principles and fine commitments in a treaty document, but the proof of the utility of that document is whether they are complied with. So we need to bear that in mind, I think, as we uh, draft a new convention. The third word that I noted down was consultation, and various participants have mentioned this in one way or another. That's consultation domestically with stakeholder groups, whether they be scientists or policy makers or um, civil society groups or universities or uh, uh, any number of um, elements of our respective uh, societies that have an interest in or are affected by plastic pollution. The next word I had down was uh, uh, looking at new technologies. And Deborah, I think you've touched on this in parallel with negotiating uh, an international instrument, of course, is the continued uh, research and development of, of new ways of dealing with plastic, whether they be biological or chemical or thermal process that are, the processes that have been mentioned. The, the fifth word I had was whole of life cycle. We need to uh, go beyond simply talking about recycling and grappling with the whole of life of plastics, which may include the chemical ingredients right at the beginning, as well as the impacts with which we're all quite familiar. Uh, the, the sixth word was stakeholder consultation, and I think I've already touched on this. Uh, the fact that we have such a broad diversity of participants in the meeting today, I think, testifies to the uh, richness that we should be drawing on and can draw on as we approach the negotiations. And a final word that uh, I forgot this morning, but I will underline now, is uh, urgency. It's not a question of waiting to see, it's a question of acting now, right now. So with those words again, Deputy Minister, many, many thanks to you. Thanks to you, Sasha, and to you, Kate, for uh, making your contributions this morning. And thanks to you, our audience, A, for being here, and B, for uh, challenging us and contesting us uh, as we continue to discuss amongst ourselves how to reach this uh, goal of a um, strong, effective, legally binding uh, instrument to address plastic pollution. Thanks a lot.